Guys, how are we doing? Today we're going to talk about freight costs. I want to help you guys understand freight costs, both to ship a tractor, to ship an attachment, to ship a tractor and an attachment. What goes into it? What drives those costs and makes them what they are? You know, some folks are surprised by how much it can be. Some folks are surprised by how little it is. So there's definitely a different perception out there, you know, from one end of the spectrum to the other. And perhaps some of that is relative to experience in the past or exposure. Maybe you've done this before, or maybe you're in the industry or maybe a similar industry where you're involved in freight a lot. So I want to give you a, a better understanding of that, a little bit of the, the nitty gritty, you know, the skinny on freight. So let's get into it. So if you like this video and you'd like to see more, please check out the other videos on my YouTube channel. Consider hitting that subscribe button below. I really would appreciate it. If you wouldn't mind, take a moment, leave a comment below, give me a thumbs up, a thumbs down, whatever you think, that'd be awesome as well. And go to goodworkstractors.com as well. I have a lot of great tractors and attachments on there. I can help you with the purchase, help with delivery and financing too. Here we go. So I really don't want to give exact pricing in this video. There's so many variables that come into play that can just fluctuate pricing up or down. And it's really just not a good idea, especially given the fact that this is the current state in time. And when you're watching this is most likely at some point in the future. We know it's not in the past. So what happens with prices in the future? They typically go up. And I kind of learned that lesson a while back in one of the videos I did early on in this channel as I put some pricing out there. And then, you know, the supplier had a price jump, a price increase, which we all know happens. And uh, I got some flack for that, you know, not honoring the old pricing. And really it was a pretty significant jump and there was just nothing I could do about it. So um, learned that lesson early on. And so again, I don't want to give you exact pricing, but I just want to give you the reasons behind why prices will fluctuate from area to area or locale to locale. And it's going to be based on a lot of different criteria. And we'll go ahead and go through that. So if you would like to get an exact price for a shipping quote on something, feel free to send me an email. I'd be happy to get back to you. And along those lines, you know, myself, other companies that are out there, doesn't matter the industry. We don't have to be talking about just tractors. It could be anything, but you'll see things offered with free shipping or discounted shipping or whatever it might be. And it doesn't mean that those costs aren't being accounted for somewhere in the total overall purchase price. It's just the way that you're marketing it. And for me, when I do things like that, which isn't that often, but if I say it's free shipping or something else, I'm adjusting that price point for the item itself to account for the actual real cost of the freight. And so you do that for maybe a few different reasons. It could be the fact that you're introducing a new product and you really want to get some good momentum, some good steam behind that product and get it kicked off in the right way. So you're introducing free shipping because when you see free shipping, you're thinking there's no additional cost, which is a good thing, right? And so you can market it in that manner and maybe introduce it to a whole, the whole US versus just your local pickup area that's maybe within 30, 50 miles of you. So it gets the potential customer base all over the country or at least regionally if you can say, hey, it's free shipping within 500 miles or something along those lines. Also, it gets kind of stale at times to look at just the same price over and over. And so if you can mix in a new concept or introduce a different concept like free shipping, it just kind of mixes it up a little bit. And you want to see what works. Sometimes you're trying to stand out from the crowd and do something differently. And so I have no problem experimenting with those kinds of things. And I have no problem telling you guys that's exactly what it is. I'm not trying to be deceitful or hide any information from you. Um, it's just simply a marketing strategy. And you better believe that I'm constantly trying to find more efficient ways of doing business. And that means freight costs, getting those down as much as possible. And it is a constant work in progress. It's something that you just can't sit back and, and let it happen. Because even if you have a good solution now, something could change and your prices shoot way up and you got to reorganize, regroup and find another solution to take its place. So freight prices do fluctuate a lot and we're going to get into that as well but I want you to know that I'm doing everything I can to get those freight costs down. You know, I'm not exactly a huge outfit here, so I don't have huge scale to be able to negotiate these low contracts for freight and everything else. So it takes a little bit more homework and more legwork for me to be able to get those kind of discounts and negotiate things, you know, to find something that's a really good value and be able to pass it along. But I really appreciate you guys supporting the business, supporting the channel. It really means a lot to me and it goes a long ways. Thanks guys. So as many of you know, all of these tractors that you see here are for sale. And while some of them will be sold locally, it's more than likely that most of these are going to be shipped out to customers in various states throughout the country. And so this kind of system didn't just happen overnight. There's been a lot of thought, a lot of evolution development that's gone into it. And so that part of the process hasn't stopped. It's something I'm definitely looking to continue improving upon and make it a better experience for my customers. And at the same time, I'm also shipping in a lot of tractors to me. So what benefits me also benefits you as well. And so it's a double-edged sword there that works to be a win-win situation. 
freight haulers are typically going to charge you, yes, by, per mile, but also by deck space that you're taking up. Because typically they're going to be able to, or at least try to, put on additional loads along with the tractor. That maximizes their efficiency in their own business that they have. So things that will affect the cost are going to be your location in the country relative to my location. The geographic location within the country is also going to matter as well. If you're along a main thoroughfare, you know, a main travel corridor like I-90 or I-75 or something like that, freight's typically going to be a little bit cheaper than it is if you're, say, at the border <laughs> near Canada or down near Mexico, you know, or even on the very far west coast. Those travel routes aren't as popular and for folks that do go those directions or say up to New England, uh, rates are typically a little bit higher. So if you're in an area that's kind of off the beaten path, rates can be a little bit higher simply because there's not as many folks, not as many truck drivers and freight haulers going in those off the beaten path directions. And so they want a little bit of a premium to get up there. There's other items as well that will affect the price for a freight hauler. One is gonna be ramps and all of my shipments require ramps, not just because of what you'll need when you offload it, but I don't have a loading dock here at my shop. So to get it on the trailer and then to get it back off, if you have ramps on your trailer as a freight hauler, you can charge a premium for it. Also, there's a lot of different times of the year they're gonna make an impact as well. So if you're around a holiday weekend, for instance, there's a lot of freight haulers that are taking time off or they're just deadheading back home to get home for the weekend and spend time with their family. If you're in the spring or the fall or the winter or the summer, there's busy times. You know, in the spring, there's a lot of um, greenhouses, flowers and plants and nurseries, and that takes up a lot of business as well for freight haulers. So there's just those seasonal considerations to take in place that can affect rates as well. You know, and there's also just additional regulations that are constantly being thrust upon these freight haulers, which is not a fun thing to have to deal with. They can only drive so many hours before they have to take mandated breaks, be off the road and reset for a certain amount of time, and then they can get back on the road. And so while I understand and appreciate the concern for safety, it does make it a bit more of an inefficient process just because when you're stopped, <laughs> nothing's going forward. So something like what you see behind me here is going to be fairly typical, although on the small side for what a tractor would ship on to you. So I use this for a lot of my local deliveries around here within two or three hours. So you'd see something that's set up like this, although it's most likely going to be a little bit bigger, you know, like an F-350 or F-450 dually with the big 40 foot gooseneck on it. You will also see some semis with flatbed trailers that have pull out ramps or ramps stored underneath that we pull out and, and attach to the back to offload. But this is gonna be the kind of setup that tractors are gonna come in on. And so we'll load this up with the tractor, with the attachments, whatever it is that you're getting. It's gonna be an open air concept like this. If you get an enclosed one, they are out there, but they're significantly pricier. And it's something that I probably wouldn't recommend unless you are made of money. So these tractors are made to be out in the elements, out in the weather, and you know, you get it there, say it gets dirty from coming in off the road, do like what I do when I get them in here, just go give it a bath and everything's gonna be just fine. And a lot of folks do get worried about having enough space down their side road or their neighborhood or wherever it is to be able to offload a tractor off of one of these trucks and trailers here and, and having enough space for the truck and the trailer to be able to move around and turn around and that kind of thing. And what you can do is you can just have them go to a nearby spot as well because guess what, these tractors are easy enough to drive down the road. So if you have a really tight location, just find some place that's nearby where they can just kind of pull off along the side of the road, that kind of thing, get offloaded right there and you'll be good to go. So once a deal is done, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and contact my freight broker. I'm gonna give him obviously my information here on where to pick up, which he'll already have. I'm also gonna give him your information on where to take this machine to. And he's also gonna need ramps because I don't have a loading dock here and you don't have a loading dock there. So it'll be a trailer that has ramps on it. So my freight broker is gonna take all of that information that I give to them. They're gonna post it to their load boards, that kind of thing. And essentially they're gonna be looking for somebody who's going from my location to your location with enough deck space for the total shipment uh, in the next couple of days. You know, I, I try to strive for one to three days to have it picked up from my shop. And then typically within, you know, a thousand miles of here, it's one or two days of transit time. Occasionally it's gonna exceed that if a driver has to reset or something like that. But, or, you know, sometimes they get a brake issue when they're going down the road or the lights go out or whatever, they have engine troubles. You know, there's always unforeseen circumstances, but uh, typically one to three days to get it out of here on its way to you and then just another one to two days. And sometimes it even happens as soon as the same day as I re put the request in, there's already a truck in that's gonna be here ready to pick up. 
And this is something I'm doing all the time, almost every single day of the year, because I'm doing this for my inbound shipments. All the tractors you see, or 95% of them, maybe 99% are gonna be shipped into me. And then, you know, again, I'm shipping a lot of these tractors out. I do ship them all over the country, literally. And right now I use one freight broker for all of my business. No, I'm not gonna share who it is because I don't want him to get overloaded. He's my freight broker, guys. But he does a fantastic job. I love working with him. He's very professional and he gets the job done. I trust him with everything. Oh, and one more thing to note because I'm sure it's gonna come up. What happens if the tractor got into an accident on the way from my place to your place? It's a very good question and, and very valid concern. So in order for a driver to take on one of my shipments, he has to provide his certificate of insurance, all the proper documentation to my freight broker. And so a load is not gonna be picked up with my tractor on it, you know, or your tractor without that proper verification in place. Now, what about shipping attachments? Well, that's a whole different animal. And so if you're ordering an attachment from me and you wanna have it shipped, not with a tractor, but just the attachment itself, I love doing that, I do it all the time, and I've been getting more and more effective at it. I guess better and better at finding cheaper solutions all along the way. And that's good for me, it's good for you, because if I can get prices cheaper, I can sell more product, and you can get it at a cheaper price as well. I wanna point out that sometimes it makes sense to buy multiple things at once, other times it simply doesn't. So when it makes sense to buy more than one piece of equipment, more than one attachment at a time, is if I can fit it onto one skid, onto one pallet. If I'm not able to do so and I have to do additional pallets, it may save a little bit of money, but they're gonna charge per pallet. And so they're charging, again, in these trucks based on floor space that you're taking up, deck space, area that you're taking up. That's one of the ways they calculate the cost. And so if you're just taking up more floor space, they're just gonna charge you for that. But if it's all in the same pallet, they're not gonna charge you nearly as much. And some attachments you can stack or bundle like that, and some you just can't. So one of the other intricacies with this kind of shipping, when you're just shipping a skid, shipping a pallet, shipping a crate, whatever it might be, is it's all density based. And so you're gonna take your volume, you know, your length and your width and your height, and you're also gonna take the weight of whatever it is. All of that information there, you can plug it in right into a, a class calculator, a freight class calculator, and it's gonna spit it out and tell you what class it is. And essentially, the lower that number, the closer to zero, the cheaper it's going to be to ship and so you know a class can be class 65 it could be a class 110 you know class 90 class 160 all that kind of stuff so those 110 shipments are going to cost more than a class 65 shipment to go to the same location so it's also going to cost more if you have to go to a residential address to a farm address if you need a lift gate all that kind of stuff even if you want to have it held will call which means held at the terminal even that is an additional charge so the cheapest way to have something shipped is to go from a commercial address, like right here, to a commercial address in your location as well. So if you have a business or you have a friend or a family member who has a business or you have access to a business where it can just get dropped off and you can go pick it up, that's gonna be the absolute cheapest way to go about this. But if you add on additional services like the residential delivery or a farm delivery or lift gate delivery, that kind of thing, the prices will definitely go up. And I do try to work with you as much as possible on that, but the costs are real to me. And so I do have to pass those on in order to actually make a profit. I wanted to give you a little example here of a shipment that I've kind of bundled together. This is actually getting ready to go out here any minute. And so I've got this tiller and a quick hitch that are bundled right onto the same skid here, right into the same pallet. And so essentially what this is doing is you're keeping the same footprint, you know, the same area or the same volume, you know, with your uh, length and width and height, you're just adding more weight by adding this quick hitch on there. And so basically that quick hitch is going to ship for no additional freight cost. It's just going to ship for the same, whether it was just the tiller or the tiller and the quick hitch. So that's a really good way to bundle it together. Let's take another example here and look at this land plane versus a tiller like this. Well, these weights are within hundred pounds or so of each other. So quite similar. However, you can see this takes up a lot less space. This big tiller right here, you know, it's only what he got. You know, a foot and a half wide this way. You have the same, it's still six foot wide, just like this land plane is six foot wide. And the height is probably the same, you know, up to this point here, and, and you maybe could fold that down. The point is, it's, it's close enough. Where you have a big difference though, is your width, this direction here. So there's all that dead space. There's no weight that's being added right in there. And so it's taking up a lot more space this way. So it would cost a lot more money to ship an attachment like this than it would to ship a tiller like that. Another example here, oh, I think I hear the uh, central transport right there. That's the company I'm using right now. I can see the yellow truck up there. 
And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to get my, my tractor with my forks. I'm going to pick up this skid here. I'm going to pick up that skid there as well. I'm just going to load these suckers on there and away they'll go. So you can see though another nice compact um, pallet right here. This is a very lightweight one, but it's also very small. So this is going to be a cheap class, be very affordable. This is something I could put a quick hitch on as well, just kind of stack it right on top there and it'd save you a lot of money that way too. So that right there is a pretty typical process of how my day goes. And so, you know, I shoot these videos kind of in between customers coming out here, taking phone calls, having shipments come in, put, sending shipments out, that kind of thing. And so just pretty typical. So when you see some of these videos that are kind of edited in maybe a little bit of a non-traditional fashion, you know, that could be the reason why. I mean, a lot of times as well, I have to do takes on one day and then finish up on another day another day also just because of that's just the way life goes you know but uh, anyway so good example there of shipping out some stuff I think one of those is going to maybe Pennsylvania and one up to Massachusetts something like that so again reasonable freight co freight costs for something like that and that size if you get to the really large attachments that are maybe not that heavy given their, their volume their density then it can be more costly that way if we're going especially all the way across country but these brush crushers, for instance, or the work saver grapples, you know, pallet forks, tillers, snow pushers, quick hitches, all that kind of stuff, I can typically ship really che cheaply, really reasonably. So really quick, I want to talk about just when you're shipping out a pallet, shipping out a skid, when you're putting a piece of equipment on there, an attachment on there, strapping it down and sending it out. So there is additional cost associated with that for me above and beyond just the shipping, the action of shipping itself. So you have the cost of a pallet to consider, you have the cost of your strapping, you have the cost of your labor, you know, and so all those things are above and beyond just actually shipping it out. And so I do count for a small amount to try to recuperate, to make up for that. So really, I just want to let you know, these are the, the flat out costs, you know, you have the cost of the freight, and then I just kind of do a peanut butter spread of the other costs just over all the shipments that I do, just kind of even it out. It's not much. It's not like strapping costs all that much. You know, a pallet can cost 20, 30, 40 bucks. I do recycle pallets as much as possible, and so I keep those costs relatively low for the most part. And then I've got some labor costs to get everything. You know, if I have an attachment that's buried way in the back there and I have to get it brought up front and put on a pallet, well, I got to move several things out of the way. You know, and I've got my, my uh, helpers, my friends that do that, Paul and my father-in-law Bill, that do that for me, but they're not working for free, if you know what I mean. So anyway, it's not a whole lot of extra cost that goes into that, but it is something to be aware of. Another way that I'm going to ship is through a distributor. I am able to do that from time to time as well. I've been starting to take on more of my own freight, but I still rely on them for help in certain situations. However, the same concept still will apply when you're shipping a pallet. You know, when you're shipping a skid or a crate, the same freight costs are going to be associated with it going from a commercial address to a commercial address or a commercial address to a residential address that kind of thing so you may see a shipment coming from me you may see it coming direct from my distributor just depending on the situation there are also smaller items that on their own can be sent just ups ground you know fedex ground that kind of thing like a home delivery you know so there are things like a quick hitch there could be other small attachments as well that are very small very compact that don't require a placement on a skid or a pallet and have to go in a semi truck Although this is really few and far between and more the exception than the rule. Well, guys, I hope that helps you understand freight costs a little bit better. You know, this isn't something that I'm making money on. It's a necessary evil. It's a cost of doing business. And so the lower I can get that cost for you, the better off we're all going to be. You know, I'm going to have more sales. You're going to get your products cheaper. It's just a win-win situation. And believe me, I'm doing everything I can to keep those costs as low as possible for you. So make sure you check out goodworkstractors.com. Again, look for your tractor there. Look for your attachment there. I'd be super happy to help you out, put together a package for you on a tractor and an attachment too. Can help with delivery, can help with financing. And please hit that subscribe button below if you haven't done so yet. We'd love to have you join the family. Leave a comment below, give me a thumbs up, thumbs down, whatever you like.
And until next time, take care. We'll see you soon.